Warning, the podcast you're about to hear has a unique conservative perspective and may be politically incorrect, containing some controversy in its message. This episode may speak out against liberalism, socialism, the dark state, and religious organizations. It is possible that evil in politics, education, law, society, and religion will be discussed and exposed. However, we believe this podcast adds truth and value to a mature, disenfranchised audience who may be tired of apostate religions and wicked world systems. Listeners who are easily offended, overly sensitive, or have progressive leanings sympathetic to the topics we expose should be forewarned not to listen any further. We thank both those who choose to listen as well as those who choose not to listen. You've been warned. And now, let us get on with the show. Hello, today's date is... Today's date is the 25th of October, 2019. You know, yesterday, I'm just, I'm going to go ahead and tell the um, listeners. Okay. Yesterday was my 30th year anniversary. Yours? So was mine too. Huh! I know. (laughs) Wow. You know, the thing is, is I didn't know um, I was that old. Me neither. We must have got married when we were like 10. At least. At least. Yeah. Grade school. Yeah. So we had our 30-year anniversary. Praise the Lord. Yesterday, October 24th. So um, if you feel like sending cards and letters, you can send it to 848 North Rainbow Boulevard, number 3239, <laughs> Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, cool, man. So that was um, that's kind of a neat thing. Yes. Amen. That's happening. Um and I couldn't have asked for a better husband. Oh, you could, you could have, but you wouldn't have got him. No. No, you wouldn't. I got the best of a lot. You could have asked for a better husband. You could, you might have got uh, Jeff Baxter. Jeff Baxter. I yeah. don't know who that is. The guy who played Jethro on the Beverly Hillbillies. Oh, for the love of He would have been a better husband than me. No. He'd be pretty cool. No. I think. I think I I like that. Jeff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of things have been happening. So that's kind of cool. And let's see, what else? Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Well, too much to talk about, really. Yep. Yeah, so we're kind of sitting in our living room on a laptop doing the show. And like I explained to you the last couple of shows, I'm just like too lazy to fire up the studio and do all that stuff. So I'm. I, it's we're, cooler out here, too. You it is cool. In the uh, studio, it's pretty warm with all the computers and stuff. Yeah, and we got like windows, and you can look outside, and I got some groovy music in the background. Mm hmm. So we start trailing off, you'll know what, because we got distracted by what's yeah, <laughs> yeah. going on on the outside. No, I'm just teasing. I know. we got our dogs here to uh, to disturb us a whole bit. So and today we have um, five stories five. and one possible video that we can talk about. Well, we better get going. Yeah. We better get going. Um, as usual, the reason why we do this show is because... The times that we live in are getting worse and worse. Absolutely. It's not better and it's not the same. Definitely not the same. I was listening to um, a gentleman the other day um, who has a a Christian podcast. And he did, uh, normally he just does scripture. And he reads scripture and he talks about it. It's very good. But now and then he does like a prophecy show uh, Kind of like this show talks about what's going on, and he he had noticed a huge jump around the 2014 15 year. Mm-hmm. Of course, you remember that that's when all the blood moons were out, and also I wrote I wrote I read a couple of books. Remember on the blood moons, and um, a lot of people thought Christ was going to return in 2015. Mm-hmm. It was a big big thing. Um, and they they made some good cases and good arguments. He he thinks that the blood boots did in fact um, bring an omen or were an omen of things to happen. Kind of like I think 2012 <laughs> really the world didn't end, but it changed. It, we did enter into a new baktun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so those are just personal beliefs. You can't prove it or say anything but I thought it was interesting how he thought 2015 things really changed and they did but I'll tell you 2019 and I knew it because we go back and we look at some of the the things I said uh, you know to Miss Kapow prophetically about 2019 
or uh, dreams I had that, um, in fact, I listened to one the other day that was a year old. It was, yes, I, that's right. You did. I had a dream vision back in May of 2018 and, uh, and I kept it on audio and I just listened to it over a year later. And the dream vision was about the coming year and an increase in paganism an increase in the occult and paganism where it becomes so commonplace, it's no longer a witch hunt. It's not, you know, everybody's a witch. Everybody's in it. And sure enough, this year we've actually seen an uptake in them, the occult and witches and witchcraft exponentially is up front and in your face. It's in your music, in the movies. And we don't even follow that stuff anymore. A lot of people do. A lot of YouTubers, conspiracy guys, they call them conspiracy guys, but there's a lot of Christians on YouTube that are following the Illuminati, the the music industry, the movie industry. They break all this stuff down for you. We haven't been doing a lot of watching that lately because we kind of got our own issues, Mm -hmm. but there are a lot of people out there watching it, and I still agree with them that there's just a lot of weird things going on, a lot of weird things going on in our weather and with our sun. And a lot of people predicting food shortages and stuff coming on. And I still have to agree with that. I can't prove it. I can't show you biblically. But that's why we do this show is to kind of to show where we're at and to expose the evil. Mm-hmm. We don't tolerate it. No. I get mad, but I don't let the sun go down on my wrath because I speak about it. Yeah, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to expose the evil, we, but we're not supposed to take vengeance. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Or and give place to the devil. Give, yes, thank you. And I, I try, I'm try. i trying not to be mean uh, to people and just write them off, you know, just because uh, they're transgender or they do this or do that. No, because we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Exactly. But their behavior is what we're pointing out. Yeah. And the increase of that kind of behavior. Yeah is prevalent in our in our world right now. Exactly. And what I wish for them and what Ms. Kapow wishes for them, that they would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Exactly. We wish that they will all come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, repent of their sins, turn from their ways, and have eternal life. It would be a much better world, a much better society if we kept our Christian values anyway. So, but anyway, we expose the evil that they're currently doing. We're not trying to damn them to hell. No, no, no. Anything like that. All right? Yep. All right. Very good. Very good. Very good. Uh, This first one is, um, do you want to read the scripture before or? Well, let's read the scripture before. Okay. um, This one one is a, a story about a man who had sexual acts, did sexual acts with a stuffed animal at Target. And the scripture I have is uh, Proverbs 17:20, which says, "He who has a crooked mind finds no good, and he who is perverted in his language falls into evil." Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nasty. Here's a guy that uh, is being controlled by demonic influences, really for sure. And demons drive; they drive; they they um, they push you to do things or think things. Behaviors, And this is obviously something that this guy is to the point where he can't control that drive to do something like this. A young guy, too. Not very old. No, he's 20. What? No, that's the date. Doesn't he's 20. Old. He's 20 years 20, old. Yes, okay. Yeah. He's from Florida. He, uh, <laughs> he sexually assaulted a pair of large stuffed animal toys inside a Target store. At least it wasn't a Walmart. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was arrested on the charges. Let's see. His name is Cody. He entered uh, the retailer around 2 p.m. Tuesday. Which is he, interesting because it's just right in the middle of the day. Yeah. Kids, mothers. He approached a display of merchandise featuring characters from the Disney film Frozen. Mm-hmm. And then um, he selected a large Olaf. I'm not sure what that is. An Olaf stuffed animal. Probably a character. Mm-hmm. He proceeded to place it on the floor of the target, and then he began to dry hump the snowman. That's so hard to... Um... Uh, yeah, and then he actually ejaculated on the Jeez. merchandise. Nasty. Okay. Uh, he returned the Olaf, the soiled Olaf, by the way, back to the display, and he went into the toy department where he selected a large unicorn. 
It was a stuffed animal, and he began to dry hump this item. Um, after consorting with the stuffed animals, he was detained inside the store. Now, he told the cops he admitted to doing stupid stuff. He admitted that he had uh, ejaculated on the animals. So anyway, the, the merchandise was removed from the store and destroyed. Thank you. Mm. Uh, the guy's father said he has a history of this type of behavior, but there's no court records or criminal cases uh, saying so. So he got a whopping $150 bond for doing that. So I'm sure he learned his lesson. He'll never do it again because he got punished so bad. Mm-hmm. Um Anyway, that just kind of shows you where we're at. Let's see. <clears throat> this one was really interesting, Miss Kapow. In Josephus, if you ever have the time to read Josephus, he's talking about AD 70, and he talks about the Jewish rebels in um, AD 70 that took over Jerusalem and were fighting the Romans. And one of the things Josephus talks about is these Jewish rebels dressed like women. They had long hair, and they wore makeup, and they wore women's clothes. And under the women's clothes, they carried daggers. And they were killers. They were assassins. And they went throughout the city assassinating people. And um, it's just kind of interesting that they would, the, the killing, the murderous spree, and they were Jews, by the way. They were Jewish rebels. They weren't. Uh, Romans or they weren't barbarians. They were Jews. They were Jews in rebellion. And this is the sacking of AD 70 when the temple was destroyed. But it's interesting that the murderous spirit would also be a homosexual spirit Mm -hmm. and a transgender spirit. And that's Josephus. So when I read this article, it reminded me of Josephus when when he talked about that. Not that this is that, but this is the same spirit, the same spirit you say today. And everybody's familiar with the Taliban, the Taliban fighters. These were guys who were assassins. They, they were in the Taliban. They killed people. That's what they did. Well, there's some rare pictures that showed up. They're photographs found in Kandahar, Afghanistan. And they were taken despite a ban on photography. And there's a story behind it. But what it shows is these two young Taliban fighters dressed in women's fine silk, blah, blah, blah. They've got full-on beards, Mm full-on Muslim Islamic beards, but they have these white fluffy turbans on, and they got full-on makeup, eye makeup, I guess foundation, lipstick, Mm -hmm. rouge, and they're holding hands. They're two men, and they're holding hands very gay-like. These are killers, assassins, that are dressed like women and would take a picture like this. I, I found it absolutely incredible. Um, the article says they're probably the least likely men to ever be willingly pictured yeah. in heavy makeup. They have painted nails. They're holding plastic flowers against the quiche background of Swiss Alpine chalets. It's almost very deceptive, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't expect this. They... Uh, They are, all these guys are gun-toting Taliban fighters. They're often holding hands and posing for photographs, which will be shown next year. The photographs were found in Kadahar, Afghanistan, back in 2002 by the Magnum photographer Thomas Durzurzak. He says they are visually arresting. Yeah, they they are very strange looking. They're remarkable because they're real. He says these are not constructed photographs. These men have chosen to have the photographs made and present themselves to the camera like that. It just shows you the agency of images to uh, destabilize our perceptions, and that it does. Mm -hmm. Apparently, photography was banned by the Taliban, but there was a handful of photo studios allowed to remain open because they needed passport photos. Uh, this guy, Dorzuzak, was in Kandahar for the New Yorker a few weeks after remaining Taliban fighters had been chased away, and he came across photographs in the back room of a studio, so he offered to buy them. He says they were more than happy. They said, look, they're not going to come back to pick them up, so take them. 
He said the photographs could be seen as an extreme form of hypocrisy, but he also found them incredibly touching. Well, I don't find them touching. I think they're very Gross. creepy. Yeah. But my point that I want to make here is that there's a common spirit of murder, homosexuality, transgenderism. It's demonic. These guys are assassins. Mm -hmm. They're hardcore assassins. Men with guns, they're hardcore macho guys, but yet they're gay. Mm -hmm. And they dress like women. And it does remind me of Josephus. I think you get to a certain point in your violence. Also, also in um, Genesis. In Genesis, is it six? Miss Kapow, where it says violence. Um, 6.11, it says, The earth was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. Mm. And that's in relation to the sons of God, the angels mating with the daughters of men and creating the Nephilim, the giants. And we know from history that the giants were gay. Mm. Uh, they didn't like women. They liked each other. So it, homosexuality is part of that disembodied spirit. And the scripture I found was um, in Deuteronomy 22, 5, where it says, A woman shall not wear man's, man's garment, nor shall a man put a woman's cloak for whoever does such things is an abomination to the Lord, his, your God. And that's part of it. It's part of uh, them being an abomination, is it? Yep. A total abomination. So it's, it's very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, the, the pictures aren't made up. But here you guys, you got the least likely guys that would be dressed like chicks um, doing that. Yeah. Well just And it, to me, it just looks, it reads as a deception. They want you to think they're something that they're not. Yeah. Yeah. This one irritated me for several reasons. I think people that participate in this kind of stuff are just brain dead. Mm -hmm. They have no idea what kind of demons they're letting in. And I'll tell you from personal experience, and Ms. Kapow will tell you from per personal experience, <clears throat> that the spirit of fear is nothing to mess with. It's not anything you want. Mm -hmm. When the spirit of fear comes on you and starts... Uh, invading your body and your mind it's a horrible horrible nightmarish experience uh, it's a demonic spirit of fear so people that participate in haunted houses and uh, in Halloween things where they get scared and they do this kind of stuff they are opening themselves up they will get today today they will get the demon in the past I think God's grace there was other protections and things like that today they will get haunted and they will be sorry for doing this. But what made me mad about this story, I, I posted this story on our Facebook page. And like usual, there's several people, you know, you don't know that share it on their pages and they share it with other people. But I saw, and I don't know their names, but, you know, some people had shared it. At least a couple of people had shared this story. And some of their friends were like, oh, boy, let's, let's get, you know, I got my plane ticket. Let's go. Oh, boy, this will be fun. You know, like... Instead of seeing what I was trying to say about it <clears throat> and how dangerous this stuff is. They saw it's fun. Yeah, they want to participate in it. That's why the First Thessalonians 5.22 says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Yeah, and this is, this is what that is. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really evil. This is something else. It's called the scariest haunted house in the United States. Requires 40-page waiver, a doctor's note, and a safe word. Apparently, this is really something else. My opinion is <clears throat> it's so dark and so demonic that the demons themselves are creating hallucinations within people, you know, and the fear of possessing them. And that's why they need all these waivers and things like that. The guy who runs it also uses, there's a hint in here where he uses hypnosis to some degree. So these people are claiming that things happen to them in this haunted house and they file lawsuits and everything's recorded and he goes to court and he shows the event and those things never happened. But yet these people swear things happened. Mm. Uh, so what does that tell you? God. This is in Tennessee. It says, you really don't want to do this. This is what every person must utter after failing to complete a tour of McCamey Manor. Russ McCamey owns and operates the most terrifying haunted house experience in America. One you're not allowed to attend until you watch a two hour long video, sign a 40 page waiver, 
create a safe word and pass a physical and more. Can you imagine that? Now, see, that to me right there <clears throat> would be, so, well, first of all, I wouldn't want to go to a haunted house, but if I were so inclined, something like that would be very, um, uh, a red flag. Well, yeah, I got to say on a 40 page waiver. Yeah. And, I, and watch a two hour long video. Yeah. And get a physical and all that stuff. That's insane. So, um, anyway, let's see. It says the uh, Summertown, Tennessee Horror House is so extreme that no one has ever, no one has ever successfully completed the experience. And yet Russ says his new haunted show, Desolation, is his most extreme yet. See, and he wouldn't be in business if people weren't... Going to this. And then you get mass shootings and rapes and child you know and you wonder why or this guy goes on a target and humps stuffed animals you wonder why society has become demon demon possessed demon demonized there's no there's no protections anymore it's um it's really a scary thing nobody's even made it to the starting clock with this new show russ said he says it's a it's a mental game it's much more difficult because of that no one's even started the clock uh Think you have what it takes to tour the manor? If you do, it only costs a bag of dog food because Russ has five dogs. If you complete the tour, Russ will hand you 20 grand. See, what does that tell you? That tells you something else. Uh, he says it's not as easy as just a bag of dog food as you probably gathered by now. The manor's website lists seven must-do items before the tour can begin. You have to be 21 years old or older. You have to have completed a sports physical and doctor's letter stating you are physically and mentally cleared. Pass a background check provided by McKinney Manor. Be screened via Facebook, FaceTime, or phone. Proof of medical insurance. Hmm. Sign a detailed 40-page waiver. Pass a portable drug test on the day of the show. Um, this is all to prevent him from, from people suing him. There's also a two-hour movie Russ requires you to watch before visiting the manor. The video, and then there were none, is a collection of every contestant who attempted McKamey Manor between July 2017 and August 2019. It says the video is basically a montage of people quitting the tour, uttering the required phrase, you really don't want to do this. Mm. Um, and you can watch the video. I wouldn't watch it, no. but you can watch it uh, right here on this news article. Um, if you're so inclined, go to our Facebook page, Fifth Hook Media, and it's posted on there. What, and, you know, Miss Capel wants to tell you, please don't don't watch it. I wouldn't watch please it. Please don't watch it. I wouldn't watch it, but please don't. Uh, let's see. When it comes to the actual tour, Russ has a list of warnings and rules you must follow. It, uh, the warnings are intense audio, lighting, extreme low visibility, strobe, fog effects damp and wet conditions, physically demanding environments, close contact with creatures, you might be touched, very real and graphic scenes of horror. Uh, there's no smoking, there's no drinking, there's no eating inside or touching props or actors. Um, yeah, guests voluntarily assume all risk and dangers, yeah. Now, who is this guy? Well, you would think that this dude was some kind of um, witch or... Yeah. But it's like you said, it's deception. Yep. Mm -hmm. They want you to think there's something that they're not. Yeah, something. even Proverbs. I don't remember what's, what uh, scripture it is where it says that, you know, the, they give you, this person gives you food, yeah. but his heart, there, in his heart, there's like seven evils or something like that. Yeah. Something to the point that, you know, he, on the surface, he seems like he's trying to do you a favor and stuff, but in his heart, he has evil intentions. Tense. Yeah. And that's who this man is. Oh, yeah. There's a picture of him. He just looks like a Because he's saying that he's very straight-laced, conservative guy. He doesn't smoke. He doesn't drink. He doesn't do any of that stuff. You know, he's just like one of the guys. He never he never did drugs. Didn't even drink coffee. He never had a cup of coffee. He never had uh, marijuana, nothing. But, you know, for someone to do something this evil and it does something to... It, it harms another person. Yeah. That's evil. Yeah. That's evil. <sighs> He says uh, he's very oh. conservative. No. He says, he, he says uh, I'm just this guy that runs this crazy haunted house that people think is a torture factory or a fetish factory. All of these things that it's not. But most people believe that based upon the films that I've made. 
Russ films every tour with his video camera. He then publishes the results on his YouTube page. So all this is for free. He wants you to get demonized. Yeah. I think if you watch those films, you're going to get scared. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a spirit of fear on you. Russ says he doesn't curse. He doesn't allow cursing during the haunted tours. If you do, and many obviously can't help themselves, he deducts cash from your potential 20 grand. See? Yeah. He says more of an inside little joke that the manor is the most extreme haunt in the world, but there's no cussing involved, he laughed. He, now, this is odd. Now, who would put in over a million dollars in something that it only costs people a bag of dog food to enter? I know it. Because he wants you to do this. <sighs> He's evil, Poop. He puts in over a million dollars for people can do this stuff for free. Mm -hmm. He says that I don't charge any money <laughs> to get into it. A bag of dog food is the initial price, which is crazy. He says, I'm not a very good business person. What a liar. Mm -mm. In other words, how do you get a, over a million dollars to put into a haunted house if you're not a good business person? How, how'd you do that? Mm -hmm. um, he likes the classic uh, stuff. Anyway, he says it's a mental game. Russ is so good at what he does, he's had people sue him over things. Now, this is interesting. They thought things they thought happened during the show but didn't actually happen. Russ doesn't film every show for entertainment. He does it to protect himself in court. He said, you'd be surprised over the years how many people have claimed something happened to them inside. And I need to go back and show whoever needs to see it in raw and unedited footage saying, here you go. Here's a complete show. And um, nothing happened. How is Russ so good at playing make-believe? He says hypnosis is a great tool. Mm. So he's, he's doing something to these people. He says, when I use the hypnosis... I could put you in a kiddie pool with a couple of inches of water and tell you there's a great white shark in there and you're going to think there's a shark in there. Now, who is this guy? How is he using hypnosis? I don't know. And when does he use it? Do the lights films. and the films? Yeah. Probably the, yeah, the two right. hour film you have mm -hmm. to watch. You're right. That's how he's hypnotizing you and doing a power of suggestions. Yeah. Dude, people, I think. I don't know. people open up their minds. He says, when you have that kind of power over people and have them do and see things that you want them to see, then they can leave here thinking it really happened. And they'll go to authorities and say, oh, whatever. And I have to come back and show the footage and say it didn't go that way at all. It saved me thousands of times, he says. Over the years, Russ has been able to tap into the fears of everyone that's come through the manor, he says he works each show around everyone's individual fear. So it's never the same show. This guy's an evil dude. Mm -hmm. He says a common fear people share is water. See what he is? Ugh, he's a warlock. He is a warlock. And the picture of him looks just like a nice, friendly guy that you would have next door. Oh, boy. But you know what got me is, like I said, some of the people that follow us on Facebook, mm -hmm. shared this with their friend group. And then the, I actually saw comments where, well, let's go. Let's get a plane ticket. I, yeah. I want to do that. They actually thought this would be a good idea. That concerns me. Yeah. Especially because we're telling you, please don't watch the video. No, oh, I wouldn't God. watch it. Um, do you have a scripture for that or, or did well, you want to give one? Um, I, I think I already gave one. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, you let's know, abstain from all evil. Okay. Let's take a short break and we'll be right back. Recently, spiritual attacks on innocent people have increased considerably. This is partly due to society's transformation into a satanic cult. Most people are clueless or hopeless in combating this spiritual mayhem. We wish to offer two good books to overcome these attacks. First, Demons in My Marriage Bed, a true story of spiritual warfare, offers one of the most effective training systems in combating spiritual darkness in order to gain personal freedom. Second, Eyes to See Unseen Enemies teaches how to see the hidden dangers which are all around us, even in places we would least expect them. Both books can be purchased on Amazon.com as a paperback or ebook. It is our desire that you will take advantage of these opportunities to increase your effectiveness in spiritual warfare and learn how to fight back instead of being a victim. We'll see you on the battlefield. Okay, and we're back. 
And uh, let's see here. We've got a couple more. Let's look at this. Let's, um, this one's disgusting. They're all I don't disgusting. Like this one, but it has to do with children. Yeah, now this is from InfoWars or News Wars. I'm assuming it's all true. Right? Mm -hmm. It's it's newswars.com. It says court allows chemical castration of seven year old boy, forces father to take classes on transgenderism. And the scripture I have for that is Matthew 18 10, where Jesus says, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. Mm. He's talking about children. For I say unto you that in heaven your angels do always behold the face of my father, which is in heaven. Wow. Mm -hmm. that's a command you know that that's not a suggestion it's a command this is disgusting a Texas father lost a court case this week forcing him to accept his 7 year old son as a girl and allow the child's mother to start giving him puberty blockers eventually the mother wants the boy to fully transition from male to female Jeffrey Younger, the father, has been fighting to protect his son from what equates to chemical castration for nearly a year. Dear Jesus. The boy's mother, I would say that loosely. Mm -hmm. She's a doctor. Dr. Ann Georgulis has been dressing the child in child and girl's clothes and telling him he's a girl, according to the child. Um... Uh, there's a video here of him saying, Mommy says I'm a girl. He's seven years old. You, know, you talk about mental illness of this woman. Just plain evil. Sorry. Yeah, she, she should marry uh, the guy with the haunted house. The ruling by the jury will likely require Younger to call his son by he, she pronouns and to attend a class on transgenderism. What the heck happened to our judicial system? I don't know. But it says 11 out of the 12 jurors decided to grant sole managing conservation, conservatorship of the couple's twin boys to uh, Giragulis on Monday. Judge Kim Cooks, another female, probably, will deliver rulings on possession, child support, and more. It doesn't say what this man does for a living, but his uh, exo lady is a doctor. I don't know what kind of doctor. I don't know if it's uh, medical. I don't know if it's PhD or doctor of education. I don't know. But she's requesting that her husband, um, his visits be supervised and that the number of overnight stays the boys get with him be reduced. She also asked that Younger be prohibited from calling his son James and instead forced to address him as Luna. How can a court mandate a parent to call the, your child your child another name? I mean, how do, how does where how far reaching is a court? In fact, Giorgolas has specifically asked the father not bring James around people who do not affirm him as a girl. That's probably his family. Sure. Anything else? Uh, Younger argues his ex-wife is transitioning the child against his will and voices concerns about his mental and physical health. That's so sad. Oh, dear Jesus. Wow. Jesus, Jesus, that is that is horrible. Jesus. Anyway, um, I'm assuming that's this is a true story. And that just says uh, we are at the at the end. We are at the brink. Because this stuff did not happen in our society before. Mm -mm. You know, did you have a scripture for that or did you I already give it? I already gave How it. How come I keep forgetting, you know? I don't know, because I just get excited. You just get excited. I think so. I think so. You have one about this one. Now, the headlines, this is about nurses who kill. Uh, medical murderers and the mystery of the Clarksburg, Virginia Hospital in West Virginia. What The point I want to make on this one is that in my humble opinion, I think these murderers, the spirit of murder, they're just going to where the victims are, just like a pedophile will go to where the children are. You know, uh, a rapist will go where the women are. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think if you like chocolate, you'll probably work at C's Candy. Yeah, that would be <laughs> ideal, exactly. You'll go where, where that stuff's at. Yeah, you had a job there, didn't you? No. You should have, you like chocolate. I do like chocolate. That's why I didn't work there. <laughs> well, I was like, uh, sometimes you, you read these arsonists 
become firemen mm -hmm. or they work for a fire department, things like that. That's what I think is this this deal. These aren't these aren't like mercy killings. These are just people who like to kill. Mm -hmm. And this is it's creepy because it creepy. I don't like they it. have access to uh, victims. Mm -hmm. Could be you, could be your loved ones. Nurse Charles Cullen worked at nine hospitals in New Jersey. Yeah, you did that good. I New did. Jersey. In Pennsylvania. Killing dozens of patients by spiking saline IV bags, saline IV bags with deadly doses of drugs physicians did not order and patients did not need. Donald Harvey, who worked as an orderly among other hospital jobs, roamed units at three hospitals in Cincinnati and Kentucky where he killed more than two dozen patients. The healthcare killers used insulin, heart drugs, poisons such as cyanide. They had access to frail patients on hospital floors. Ultimately, they were convicted of murdering patients under their care. Yeah, none of these guys, sometimes they're called the angels of death. Yeah, they, but they, they did that as, as a mercy kill though. Yeah, these these these, ones, uh -uh. these guys are just killing people. They, they, get, they get a thrill out of it. They're murderers. And they're, they're going where they can murder. And, and they could do it really uh, with almost impunity. It's mm -hmm. really hard to catch something like this. Investigators assembled clues in at least two homicides and at least eight other suspicious deaths at a Clarksburg, West Virginia Veterans Affairs Hospital. Passing, you know, that would be a perfect hospital to do it, Veterans Affairs. You know, there's not a lot of people paying attention at these hospitals. Past examples of healthcare workers who killed patients with unneeded medications, including insulin, drugs suspected in the VA deaths, show how difficult such cases could be to detect and prove. This one guy, Colin, Look at this kid's face. He looks like he's something out of a movie. I mean, look at that. He's a black-eyed. He's a black-eyed young man. Mm -hmm. Just pitch black, black-eyed. I mean, just look at that look. Yeah, it's scary. Colin moved from hospital to hospital, taking new jobs when managers begin to suspect his daily ways. So just soon as someone suspects, then you just get another job. You're in the medical field. Although investigators collected forensic evidence implicating him, prosecutors did not charge him until a fellow nurse wearing a wire coaxed a confession. Mm, good for him. Yeah. Harvey's arrest was a matter of luck. He used cyanide to poison a man hospitalized after a motorcycle crash, unwittingly triggering an Ohio law requiring autopsies on all motorcycle fatalities. Mm. Fatalities. Now, here's what's interesting. The medical examiner who performed the autopsy had a genetic ability to smell cyanide. And that triggered the investigation. See, your sin will find you out. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Look at that. Otherwise, they would have never, never. This is him. This is a picture of Harvey in 1985. Otherwise, they never would have caught him. Uh, they say there's no formal statistics tracking the number of healthcare workers convicted of murdering patients. Why? Do you think there should be? Mm -hmm. Do you think FBI should track that? Such cases are distinct from medical errors, sure, or mistakes. Uh, these are serial killers. They're often called angels of death, but those familiar with their behavior say the moniker rarely describes their crimes. More often, they kill with intent and out of compulsion, not compassion. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a criminologist uh, at Birmingham City University in England. She studies nurses who kill. Yeah. And she did a 2014 research paper. She identified 16 convicted of murder over the past four decades. That's a lot. In the United States, Belgium, Finland, France, Germany, Italy, and the United Kingdom. So it's common. Mm -hmm. uh, cases studied in Elizabeth Yardley's 2014 research paper. Uh, geez, here's, here's pictures of a lot of these people, female and male. Jeez. All these people, look at this. Wow. She has a whole list of all these people and where they, where they worked at. Intensive care unit, a lot of it is... Uh, Wow, ER, That's stuff like sad. that. She has the number of, you know, the year of conviction, the whole thing. What she found out is what insulin was the drug most frequently used to poison patients. Healthcare killers also use sedatives, muscle relaxers, blood thinners, heart drugs, even bleach. Mm -mm. Some started with one drug and moved to another as the pace of their killings increased. In most cases, the killers poisoned patients with drugs taken from the hospital where they worked. Some nurses had legitimate access to the medicines. Others stole the drugs by bypassing safeguards, secured medication. 
Uh, and it's a real challenge, you can imagine, to investigate something like this because these are people who have access to their victims. Mm -hmm. And drugs. And drugs. Um, so, you know, they go on, they say it's very hard to prove. And it's probably going on today. And, you know, off, obviously, if they're using insulin, this article also says that testing for insulin is very tricky. It's not, uh, it's not an easy thing to do to uh, test for it. So there's probably a lot of stuff going on, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I heard, and I read somewhere there um, that it's a very tricky investigation. Yeah. And that's probably why they really don't want to take it on. You know well, I mean? that too. And then look at the hospitals. Do you think hospitals want this stuff out? Really, the healthcare providers want this out? Mm -hmm. Hey, it's a shame, about, but they want this swept under the rug. Yeah. You know, so who knows? Well, the scripture I have for this is John 8, 44, where Jesus says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. And he was a murderer from the beginning. Yeah. Boy, ain't that the truth. A liar and a murderer. Well, that's an... Okay. Let's see. One last thing. Let's see. The way things ought to be. And um, it's a story, but it's actually a video. The video, you, you can find by Googling or typing in, but if you want to go to our Facebook page, you can. It's up on there. Uh, what it is, it's a coach that disarmed and then hugs a student in a high school shooting. Um, let's see where this was at, if I can remember correctly. It's a video. We, we watched this video. I watched it again the other day. It is quite amazing. This guy comes in with a gun into the school with a shotgun. And um, this coach uh, then is what is then grabs him and just hugs him, mm -hmm. and this why one teacher takes the gun away and just uh, it's just it's just like compassion on this guy. It's quite incredible um, to see something like that. And then they interviewed the the teacher. He was a football coach, and the student was eighteen years old. And uh, and it just show the video footage just shows him hugging him like with compassion and, and mm. crying over him and stuff. And just um, I would like to think probably that that guy that coach was probably a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, and he probably knows this boy. Yes, you know what I mean he knows he who he is. Feels for him. Yeah, whatever he, the kid's going through. Apparently, this guy ha was having a a mental um, a meltdown that day. And uh, came into school with that loaded shotgun, had a mental meltdown. But this guy saved a lot of lives, but probably also saved his. Sure. You know? Um, quite hopefully. A, quite amazing. He'll be on a road to, um, you know, to Re health. Recovery. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's about it, Ms. Kapow. All righty. Well. Shall I tell you? Ciao. Ciao, babies. Good night.